The passage that was read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 may sound familiar to you. It was the same scripture reading that we had two weeks ago when we started this lesson, but we're not able to finish it. So I want to finish it tonight, but we didn't look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 two weeks ago, and so I want to make sure that we start there tonight, especially in verse number 7. The whole passage there deals with the unique nature of the gospel. When it gets down to verse 7, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it calls us as human beings. It calls us as Christians, earthen vessels. Here we are, uh, temporary. Here we are, made of clay, as it were. Here we are, molded and shaped by God, but we are not intended to last forever. At least our physical bodies are not. They are merely earthen vessels. But notice what God has placed into us. Notice what God has given to us. To us who are feeble, to those of us who are finite, to those of us who are imperfect, to those of us who make mistakes, to those of us who even when we have that which is perfect, stumble and fall as we carry it. God has given to us something that He calls a treasure. The gospel, as it's put in the context of these verses, is a treasure. That's what God calls it. God uses that word in a variety of ways throughout Scripture. You go back to Malachi chapter 3, and it's about uh, down in verse 7 or so, maybe verse 6, where God calls His people His jewels. He looks down at His people in the Old Testament and calls His people His jewels, His treasure. You go to 1 Peter chapter 2, about verse uh, 9 or verse 10, over in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it calls His people His own special treasure. He uses that word in a variety of ways, but here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he talks about his word as being a treasure. If someone were to break into your house, and obviously we hope that doesn't happen, if someone were to break into your house and to steal all of your valuables, what is the likelihood that they would run off with your copy of God's word? That's not very likely, is it? Now, you remember our missionary Troy, when he first went down to Paraguay, had his Bible stolen. Of course, the thieves that broke into his car weren't looking for his Bible. They saw a computer bag in the back seat of his car, and that's what they were after. And poor old Troy not only kept his computer in his computer bag, but he kept his Bible that he had marked up in preaching school in that bag. So he not only lost his computer, but he lost his treasure, his copy of God's Word. Now, of course, he could call up the, bo the bookstore and order another one. You could go down to the local bookstore and you could buy another treasure. But how much is this book worth to you? Not the physical book, not necessarily the pages that, that grow old with use, but how much are the words of this book worth to you? God calls it a valuable treasure. And so we want to continue tonight this concept of talking about the riches of the gospel and recognizing that God's treasure that God's riches that we have in the Bible are unlike any other treasure on this earth. Because this is the kind of treasure that never runs out. It's not a treasure box that you can run to and take a little bit out of, and that Les can run to and take a little bit out of, and that Paul can run to and take a little bit out of, and then once Phil gets over there, there's nothing left. It's a treasure box that is infinite in its content, infinite in its value. It's a treasure that is, that is infinite, that is beyond any comparison in its superiority over every other treasure. Every other treasure that you have. What does Jesus say in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20? Lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Where what? Where moth and rust destroy. Where thieves break in and steal. My grandfather used to keep mothballs all over his house. And there's some of you 
who probably keep mothballs in your house. I don't have a single mothball in my house. That's not because I don't believe in them. That's just because I've never had a, a desire to have mothballs. But some of you know what we're talking about. Because you don't want moths coming in and eating up that which is valuable to you. Some of you have had your valuables rust out. You live in South Florida. Anybody ever have rust on their car? Anybody ever try to put Bondo on there and sand it down and put Bondo and refinish it? Only to come back a couple months later and what's happened? The rust won. The Bondo lost. You ever had thieves break in and steal? This is a treasure. This value cannot be, we, we talk about it as a treasure, we talk about it as riches, we talk about it as valuable, and yet we want to put, it, we put, we want to put a dollar sign there. We want to compare it with some other treasure that we have, but you can't do that. Because it has no comparison. It is of eternal value. It will last forever. And so with that as a background, last week we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about how the Word of God is of greater value than anything we have on this earth. And we talked about how valuable CPR is to our world. They tell us, at least some statistician somewhere, tell us that uh, some 400,000 people have a heart attack, ha have some kind of cardiac arrest away from a hospital every year. 400,000. And you know that the majority of those don't make it to a hospital before they pass. They estimate that there's somewhere around 92,000 people who have been saved by CPR every year over these last several decades. About 92,000 people whose lives have been saved by CPR. And then the image that we had on the screen is that which is out in our lobby and what you see in many lobbies. Many, uh, many uh, public places, the, the AEDs, where they have found that if, if you can get that electrical shock to the heart within moments of that cardiac arrest, that we could save even 20 or 40,000 lives every year. And yet we talk about the Bible and how it's able to save lives, not physical lives. How the Bible has been given to save people from death, save them from spiritual death. We talked about how you can even take a step back and, and not just from death itself, but from horrible disease that exists on this earth. What's the worst disease you've ever heard about? What's the worst disease that you have ever uh, known in history? There's been a number of them, the bubonic plague and, uh, and a number of others. Smallpox was one back in the 20th century. Smallpox killed at, at least 500 million people in the 20th century alone. And yet how valuable was that antidote. How valuable was that vaccine that, that came along that could take care of the smallpox disease? You've got something more valuable than that in your possession. Because we're not talking about some physical disease. We're talking about the worst disease that's ever been known to man, the disease of sin that infects and affects every uh, accountable person on the face of this earth. You've got the cure for it. Right here in your hand. You can, you can save not just 500 million, not some, you can save every person you come across, not by your own goodness, but what does 2 Corinthians chapter 4 say? But by the power that is in the Word of God. We talked about the Word of God being like a converter machine, like some kind of a conversion chamber, like what uh, Stephen Urkel stepped into and he came out Stefan Urkel. He was a changed, I was going to say a changed man. He was a changed little boy. Uh, he was a changed person when he came out of that conversion machine where Stephen Rogers went in that skinny old dude and he came out uh, looking like somebody else. Here, here. Do you have one of those? Do you have the ability not only for someone else but for your own self to step into a converter, to step into a conversion machine and to come out on the other side completely changed, to come out on the other side a new person. When somebody's baptized, they go into that water, the old man of sin. They bury that old man of sin and they come out raised to walk in newness of life. But you know, it's not just... In, the, in baptism that that happens. When you read Ephesians 4, you read Colossians 3 and other passages, 
that talk about putting off the old man and putting on the new man, those passages are not being written to people who are not Christians. Those books are being written to people who are Christians. And so even as Christians, there is a, there is a need for us to continually be renewed by this power that's able to convert our heart and convert our lives. We looked at those three two weeks ago, but I want to share with you a couple others tonight, and hopefully four others if we have time. Four other comparisons that we can make to the value of the Word of God, and yet how much more valuable it is than anything we know on this earth. There was discovered a few years ago what might look to you like it's some kind of a uh, pocket watch. But back several years ago, it was discovered this unique, what's called an English long neck compass that was housed inside of a blonde uh, tortoise shell uh, casing. It had an emerald dial on it that had absolutely no cracks, no chips uh, in, in, that, uh, in that dial. It had an English bar needle uh, with a jeweled cap. Uh, it had what was known as this earliest plunger type uh, transit lock that you see on the top. And it was discovered with its original crystal on it. Some years ago, uh, they found this and estimated it to have been crafted somewhere around the year 1770. Here's something that, would, that was crafted around the year that this nation came into existence, obviously it was from the nation of England. And it was sold for $3,000. Could you buy a compass for, for less than $3,000 today? Could you go to the dollar store and find a compass for less? How much is a compass? What's the most, what's the most valuable compass that you could find? To somebody, this compass was worth $3,000. Except it may not be as useful to some as this particular model, what's called the, uh, the Brunton Geo Pocket Transit Compass. Sells for about 700 bucks. That's a little bit more than I want to spend for a compass. But here's a compass that was, spe uh, that was specially engineered to give accurate readings in any hemisphere down to a half of a degree. It, it measures vertically, and I'll just say horizontally, although that's not the word that they use. It measures vertically. It measures horizontally. It has this hinged, it's a hinged uh, clinometer that, that allows people who use it, and, and I know that they have a special name for those who use it, but I'll just call it the people who use it. Uh, it allows these people who use it to get down to the finest detail to know where they are. But what's interesting about this compass, and what's interesting about that compass made back in 1770, is you know they all do the same thing. You pull them out, and you know what they do? They all point north. Doesn't matter how much you spend. Now, maybe if you get one at the dollar store, it's not so good. And, uh, and maybe, it, you know, it won't point north all that long. Or, or maybe if you go stick it next to a, a little magnet, it'll start getting confused. You ever done that? It's one of those cheap uh, compasses. I, I don't think this $700 compass is going to be fooled by a little magnet that you put next to it. But you know where we're going. If people can place this much value on a compass today, is this book like a compass? Is God's Word like a compass? Turn your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want us to see how the Bible describes this book to be like a compass. It's like a compass. You go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and here's how it describes. We're going to look at a couple verses at the end of chapter 2, and then we're going to look at a couple verses at the beginning of chapter 3. Here's what I want us to see about this compass. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting verse 13. Paul says, but we are bound, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, we are bound to give thanks to God, not just sometimes, but always for you, brethren, beloved by God, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. How is somebody saved? What brings them to salvation? Look in verse 14. To which 
He called you. You know, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk, and a lot of verses in the New Testament that talk about, talk about God calling people. Sometimes it says that, that in Ephesians 1 and verse 4 that we are the elect of God. How did God elect us? In some passages, we are, it is said that we are called by God. You remember Jesus saying that there are many who are called, but there are few who are chosen. How is it that God calls people today? You have it right here in verse 14. You might underline this in your Bible. How does God call people to which he called you by our gospel? How are people saved? Verse 13. Verse 14, they're saved by the gospel. Well, that's what Romans 1 and verse 16 says. It says, I'm not ashamed of the, of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. How are people saved, sanctified is by the gospel? That's how God calls every person to salvation is through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Son. But look at what it says at the end of verse 14. What does this gospel also do? We've been called by the gospel of Christ for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you are called by the gospel, guess where it points you to? Just like every compass points north, when you pick up the Bible, guess where it's going to point you to? Guess where it's going to point you to obtaining, to receiving, to, to having something? It's going to point you to heaven every time. Would it confuse you if you picked up the Bible and it started pointing you in another direction? Would it confuse you if you picked up your Bible and you all of a sudden started thinking, well, maybe God doesn't want me to go to heaven? 1 Timothy chapter 1, or 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says God desires all men to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth, and to go to heaven. So God gave us a compass to know how to get there, and it always is pointing us towards heaven. Now go to chapter 3. Look at chapter 3 and verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. What's the Lord going to do in His faithfulness? He will establish you, number one. He will guard you, number two, from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord. Why? Because He's faithful. He's going to establish us and guard us. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you because we know that you, will, that you do and you will do the things that we command you. Now, verse 5. What did the Lord, the faithful Lord, do in verse 3? He established you. What did He do in verse 3? He guards you. Now, what does He do in verse 5? He's directing you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Isn't that what a compass does? Those people who are trained with a compass, it's not just that they pull it out and it points north, but those who are trained in its use know when they, when they pull it out and they can get a measurement down to a half of a degree, it shows them which direction they need to go. Isn't that what God is doing when He directs us? He points to heaven. But He not only points to heaven in this book, He tells you how to get there. Does God tell you every turn that you need to take to get to heaven? You ever ask somebody for directions? You ever ask somebody for directions and when, after you ask them directions... You went and you asked somebody else for directions because you really weren't very confident in the first person giving you directions because their directions were kind of vague. You know, just go down here a little bit, you know, just, yeah, and, th and then you go a little further and, th and then take that first turn. Really? Where am I supposed to? Have you ever just left without any confidence at all and so you go find somebody else? Can we have confidence? Isn't that what Paul just said? We have confidence in the Lord that when He directs us to heaven, we don't need to question it. When God points the way, I don't have to say, are you sure about that, God? When God points the way, what is He doing? His Word is like a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, the Bible says, O Lord, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Without God, we don't have a clue where to go. But with His compass, He points to heaven. With His compass, He shows us how to get there. And with His compass, He guides every step that we take. Do we know how rich we are? Do we know how wealthy we are when we've got this book? We have a compass that's worth more than 700 bucks. We've got a compass that's worth more than 3,000 bucks. We've got a compass that is worth eternity in heaven with God. 
But it's not just like CPR or a cure or a converter chamber or it's not just like a compass. And I don't want this to be offensive to anybody and, 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 and don't take it offensively at all. But how many millions of dollars are spent every year by individuals who go and they seek, they seek counseling? And I know there's many good reasons that we need to seek counseling today, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful that there are people who have gone to school uh, and have educated themselves in such a way that, that, they, can, uh, that they can provide advice, that they can provide uh, uh, expert advice in different avenues of life to help people make it through difficult moments and troublesome times in their lives. I'm thankful that there's people like that. But do you know how many millions of dollars are spent people going to counselors? I would venture to say that most counseling sessions today cost, um, and it depends on where you go, I would say, but a good $100 for each one, $200, $300. There's some people who spend uh, upwards of $500 to $1,000 a week in counseling. may spend fifteen dollars to, to forty dollars to $60,000 a year in counseling. And again, I'm not putting any of that down because I, I know that much of it is, uh, is necessary and valuable. But I want us to compare that notion of going to someone for counsel. You know, the book of Proverbs says at least four or five times, a uh, number of times throughout the book of Proverbs, where it says, in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. And sometimes I think that we need to be cautious in seeking advice and in seeking input for our lives and seeking counsel from others who are not Christians. And I realize that there are very, very, many good counselors who are not Christians. But sometimes if they don't share our values, if they don't share our convictions, some of the counsel that they may give, while it may be very insightful and useful to others, it could be detrimental to our souls if we were to follow it. And yet... Again, I realize how valuable it is. But I want you to think about when people have marriage problems and they start asking their friends at work for advice. Their friends at work who don't share their values, who don't share their, their principles that they're trying to live by. Where they go talk to their neighbor, they might call up a family member when they're having trouble and, and they're trying to figure out what they're to do in this part of their life. Is it possible that this book could be described as a counselor for us? Is it possible that this book could provide some advice for our lives? And again, if you are one who is, is seeking counsel in a professional way, I'm not telling you to stop that. But what does this book have to offer us? In Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, I know we know the first part of the verse very well. I don't know that we know the last part of the verse very well. Romans 15 and verse 4, the Bible says, Those things that were written aforetime, and we talk about that being the Old Testament. Those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. But what does the rest of the verse say? We often quote the first part of that verse. Those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. But the rest of the verse says that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Have you ever been at a point in your life where you just didn't know if you could go on? Have you ever been at a point in your life when you thought all hope had just vanished? Here the Bible says it's not only for our learning but when we learn it, that Scripture is there, that we through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures might be instilled and built up with hope. 
You know, when Paul was talking about the second coming of Jesus in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he starts in verse 13 and he says, I don't want you to be like those other people out in the world who don't have any hope. And he described the second coming of Jesus and how glorious it's going to be. And then he gets to the last verse of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and he says, Now, therefore, go and comfort one another. With what? Comfort one another with these words. Can this book, in our moments of despair, provide us with comfort? The book of Psalms was a book that the Jews used as their song book. That they would go back and sing many of those psalms as a part of their assemblies. And we sing some of them today. You know, some of the songs that we sing comfort us, don't they? Build us up in our hope. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or woe? Does that song comfort us? When we hear, oh yes, He cares. I know He cares. Are there passages in this book not only where we might seek counsel to comfort us, but sometimes we seek counsel because we need peace. Doesn't the Bible call the gospel the gospel of peace? Sometimes we seek counsel to try to, to find some kind of guidance for our lives. We try to find advice for what we need to do. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 is a verse that we know. But do you know that it's a verse that shows us that the Bible is a book that is, that is a counselor for us? The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, all Scripture, not just the Old Testament, not just the New Testament, every bit of it, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Sometimes we go and we seek advice. Sometimes we, uh, we, we uh, go to a counselor to get, get some, uh, uh, some counsel advice on wh what we need to do at this point in our lives. We're facing a decision. What, what do you think I ought to do? What does 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 say? It is profitable. That's what we're talking about. Is the riches, the wealth, the treasure of the Word of God. It is profitable to us. For what? It's profitable to us for doctrine. Here's a book that will tell us what is right. If we're looking for what's the right way to go, it's going to point us in the right direction. It's profitable not only for doctrine, but for correction. If we want to know if a certain decision is wrong, if a certain path that we're looking at is wrong, here's a book that'll tell us. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable not only for doctrine and for reproof, that's the second one, for correction. If we're headed down a wrong path, if we get into this book, God will help get us on the right path. He'll help to get us right, and it's profitable for instruction and righteousness. He'll help us to stay on the path that is right. I'm not saying we shouldn't be going and seeking counsel from others, but if we constantly seek counsel outside the pages of this book, we are missing out on the greatest treasure for counsel that exists on this earth. God's Word is there to comfort us, to guide us, to encourage us. And brethren, I don't, know that, I don't know that we are the students of this book that we ought to be. Because in those times of distress, we ought to have the Word of God so written on our hearts that it's already there to give us hope. That's enough on that, and we've got two more, and I want to cover these very quickly. How much would you spend? How much would you spend for the most expensive dinner that you've ever, or how much have you, how, how much have you spent? Most expensive meal you have ever eaten. Most expensive meal you have ever paid for, not somebody else has paid for, the most expensive meal you have ever paid for. How much was it? Uh, how much would you be willing to spend? If you had been in Thailand back in 2007, and if you were one of the 15 people that were a part of this particular gathering back in Thailand in 2007, 
And if you were a part of this gathering where they had flown in, I think it was six chefs from all over the world to prepare for you. They flew in food. They flew in ingredients from all over the world. Six chefs from all over the world to prepare a 10-course meal. How many have ever had a 10-course meal? I mean, that just... How do you make it through a 10-course meal? They, they prepared for them a 10-course meal, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the names of these dishes that they provided in this 10-course meal. I can pronounce... No, I can't pronounce that either. I can pronounce oyster and lobster and black trout. But you look at these words, and these are words that I don't see on many menus, you know, where I go. But the menus I see say ham burger, you know what I mean? But here, here we've got all of these, these expensive, and all of these ingredients, 15 people were fed a 10-course meal. And then at the end of the dinner, each one was given their bill. You ever called for a check when you've been eating? You're getting ready to go, hey, I'll, I'll take the check now. Now, mind you, this bill <laughs> did not include tax or tip. Now, you know that that's not included on your check when you get it, right? You do know that, right? You're supposed to leave more than what's on there. Now, it, imagine you got a bill. Doesn't include tax, doesn't include tip. They laid it on you. And your meal alone, not, not, not the other 14 people there, just your 10-course meal alone was $30,000. That had to be some good food, right? I mean, however you pronounce it, it better taste good. 30000 bucks. How do you tip? How do you tip on 30000 bucks? That's what I want to know. You know, you ever been at the person, hey, I'll just pick up the tip if you'll pick up the check. I don't even want to pick up the tip at that table if it's 30000 bucks per person. That's the most expensive meal I've ever been able, that I have been able, you can go and Google. See if you, can, if you find one that's more expensive than that, let me know um, and, uh, and I'll go with you. But uh, $30,000, you think this book can compare with that? You think this book has anything to feed us? When you talk about fine cuisine, you know, there's not many words in here that are that hard to pronounce. And most of them have to do with somebody's name in the Old Testament, right? When you get to Mahershal Hasbaz in the Old Testament, you're just like, okay, I'm just going to skip right over that and see what this guy did, but I'm not going to try to figure out how to pronounce his name. It's been found that the average word in this book, and it was said here not long ago, is only five letters in its length. God gave us a book that can be understood, but here's a book that is like food to us. Look in, look in the book of Hebrews. Let's just look at a couple verses in the book of Hebrews, then we'll go on to the last point. But is the, is the word of God, is it like fine cuisine to you? Have you ever sat down to feast? On the Word of God. Sometime I want you to write down the word feast. And then I want you to mark out one of the letters in the word feast, which will tell you what Jesus did for 40 days and 40 nights in Matthew chapter 4. You don't have to think long to figure that out, right? You write down the word feast, you mark out one letter, and you find what did Jesus do for 40 days and 40 nights. What we think is that Jesus did what for 40 days and 40 nights? He fasted for 40 days. Well, what does that mean? What that means is he did not take any physical food into his body for 40 days and 40 nights. But at the same time that he was fasting, put the E back in, he was feasting for 40 days and 40 nights on the fine cuisine of the Word of God. So that when the devil came to tempt him, what did he have to say? It is written. How often do we feast? On this book. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, 
We are called partakers. Have you ever been a partaker? You ever gone to a meal? Here we are in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 called partakers of the heavenly calling. Look in chapter 5 verse 13. You know this section of the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13. Everyone who partakes only of milk. There's some parts of scripture that are like milk. They are easy. But if that's all that you feast upon, then you're unskilled in the word of righteousness. Because there's another part in verse 14 that's not just milk. There's another part of the word of God that is like meat. Verse 14 in the New King James calls it, it's like solid food. And you know what a baby can take. You know that a baby progresses from the milk up to the solid food. Where are you? Where are you in the food continuum? Can we say that? Where are you in the food process? Are you still in the milk Or have you moved on to those meatier matters of the law? Here's a book that you can feast on it and feast on it and feast on it. And never be full. And this never becomes empty. Look in chapter 6. Look in chapter 6 and verse 4. Chapter 6 and verse 4 talks about those individuals who had become Christians. And it says it's impossible for those who have become Christians if they fall away, verse 6, to renew them to repentance if they willfully sin. And and we'll just put that into another topic for another time. But here's how it describes those who have become Christians. They were, in verse 4, once enlightened by the gospel of Christ. They have tasted the heavenly gift. What does that taste like? What does the heavenly gift of God taste like. They have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. What does that taste like? Verse 5, they have tasted the good Word of God. How does the Word of God taste to you? How often do we get into the Word of God and feast upon it? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, those Christians were told to desire, to crave. What do you crave? Do you crave chocolate? Do you crave, uh, what do you crave? Whatever kind of food that you crave, do you have a greater craving for this? Do you crave five guys French fries? What do you crave? I'm not asking do you crave the grease and the calories. Do you crave the taste? Do you, what do you crave? Do you crave, do you desire the Word of God so much so that you can taste it? You see, this is more valuable than a $30,000 meal. This is a meal that can satisfy you for all of eternity. And you're rich. You don't know how rich you are. You are rich because you've got it in your possession. Let me share one other attribute of the Word of God and how rich we have it, and then the lesson will be yours. Several years ago, there was discovered one of what is believed to be only about 10 or maybe 12 of these that are still in existence. Back in the 18th century, Switzerland, there was an individual by the name of Abraham Louis Breguet. I have no idea how to pronounce his name. That's all I'm going to say about it. He was a a very well-known innovator, but especially of clocks. And what you see on the screen is uh, one of his rare, what was called a uh, sympathique clock. What's so rare about it? You see how it's covered with gold. You see how every detail of it is uh, stunning gold with a red tortoise shell cover around it. But what was interesting and why it was called a, a sympathy clock is that you could take your pocket watch, place it inside of this clock, and this clock overnight would wind your pocket watch automatically, sync the two clocks together, So that when you got up in the morning, your clock was already synced and your your watch was already synced and already wound for your day. 
made by this man somewhere around the year 1795. Last December, one of these clocks sold in an auction. How much would you, I mean, if I started trying to auction this off, how much, up in New York, they had an auction December of last year, and this clock was auctioned off for $6.8 million. I mean, you got some clocks in your house. Yeah, hey, come see how much you want to pin for this, right? I mean, I'll make you a deal, half price or something, right? $6.8 million for a timepiece that tells you what time it is. That's pretty valuable, isn't it? I mean, somebody really wanted that clock to spend that kind of money. How valuable is this book? Is it worth more than $6.8 million to us? Is this book anything like a clock? You know it is because we have a book in our possession that tells us the time, doesn't it? Does this book tell us what time it is? Throughout this book it tells us that time is fleeting. It's momentary. Old Testament and New Testament. The Bible calls our lives a vapor. It's temporary. Time is passing. Sometimes in the Old Testament, multiple times in the Old Testament, it calls our lives, it's just a vapor. Uh, sometimes it refers to life li- like, like a speeding postman. I, I don't guess you're allowed to speed as a postman anymore, but they used to have to travel pretty fast to make their routes, and so they, it would describe life like a speeding postman. Life is passing us by. It is fleeting. You know that Job in Job 14 said about life that he who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. But he's a few days. Our life here is not intended to last forever. But it's not only a clock that tells us that time is fleeting. It's a clock that tells us what time it is. If you're still in the book of Hebrews, look in Hebrews chapter 3. Bible tells us When we need to do things. The Bible tells us when we need to obey the Lord. Look in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Go down to verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called, what? Today. Go to chapter 4. Uh, No, before you get to chapter 4, look in chapter 3 verse 15. While it is said, today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Go to chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, He designates a certain day, saying to David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. How many times is that? Six times? In, in, in a matter of just uh, 15 to 20 verses? God says, when do we need to get on the ball? When do we need to get on the ball and do what God says? We need to do it today. You know, I've often used that passage in a study with someone, what they needed to do to become a Christian. Sometimes I've used the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 where it says, Now is the acceptable time. Now is the time of salvation. But you know what's interesting about 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 in the book of Hebrews? They're not written to people who are not Christians. Those verses are not being stated to people who are not Christians and it's telling them today you need to become a Christian. No, God was telling Christians today, right now, you need to get busy in serving the Lord. This book is valuable to us because it's like a clock. It tells us what time it is. And when it tells us what time it is, it says, you don't have long on this earth. And since you don't have long, right now is the time to get busy in serving God. We could talk more ways about how valuable this book is. But don't let us take this book for granted. Don't let us be someone who, when we go home, we're going to put this on the table, on the shelf. We're going to leave it in the car so that it's there when we we go back to church the next time. Let us be students of this book. 
Let us be those who feast upon it, who crave it, who desire it. You know how valuable a compass is to somebody who's out in the field if they never look at the compass? You could spend a million dollars and have the most advanced compass in the world, but if you never look at it, what good is it? We've got the most valuable compass there is, but if we never open it, it has no value to us. May God help us to treasure His Word that He's given to us. If you're not a Christian tonight, why don't you become one tonight? God wants to richly bless you tonight. God wants to give you His gift, His invaluable gift of salvation, if you'll just give your life to Him. If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, that's what the Gospel teaches, that He died for us, that He was buried, and that He was raised again. If you believe that with all of your heart, you can decide tonight, I want to stop serving my own desires and myself. I want to start serving God. I want to turn my life over to God. If you decide that tonight, you can come down these aisles tonight, do what they did in the New Testament to become a Christian, confess the faith that's in your heart, be baptized. We have water here. We have garments here. We have people here ready to encourage you. You Give your life to the Lord tonight. Have all of your sins washed away and allow the blood of Jesus to totally change your life. As a child of God, you've already done that. What He calls upon us to do is to walk with Him in the light. If we can help you tonight, please come as together we stand and sit.